I'm really excited about this webinar on how to effectively design test automation strategies. So if you're struggling with automation testing and want to discover how to effectively design test automation strategies, what capabilities are a must for your automation test suite, how to deal with failures and success, you're in the right place. And also, I want to give a big thank you to Progress for partnering with the Guild on this webinar. Make sure to learn more about them. You can do that by clicking on the Learn More tab, which has a bunch of links to all the bunch of information that's going to help you with automation and learn more about progress. So really excited to have them on the webinar today. So thank you all for joining us. If you don't know, Romero is going to be joining us, and he has over 20 years of experience in software engineering, QA, and management. And he's worked with small startups and large multinational enterprises. He's spent over a decade on Telerec and Progress in roles including project management, sales, engineering, testing product leadership. And so he has a full spectrum uh, of end-to-end -end type of testing that I think you're really going to find a lot of value from. We also have Andy joining us. And Andy has worked in the industry for over 15 years, including as a sales engineer, product manager, scrum master, and consultant. And he's overseen the implementation of optimizing and automation software of thousands of customers. So he really knows his stuff. He's also a certified scrum master, agile project, uh, um, and product manager coach. So really excited to have them both here. So Romero and Andy, we're both, we're all about to go live. Hey, Andy. Hey, Romero. Welcome to the Guild. Let's kick it off, I guess. Yeah, I can jump in with that. Well, thanks again, Joe. We appreciate you having us on and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk to you in the Guild. Joe did a great job introducing us, but... Uh, just so you can see maybe a, a better picture of, of the two of us. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a good shot of us. Um, you know, we've got some basics here. I think Joe kind of already described as far as, uh, you know, this is, is being recorded. You have the ability to chat and feel free to send questions out as well. So I'm just going to jump down in here so we can start the discussion really and, and, and get to what's what's important. Um, and, and Ramiro and I, we were, we were talking about this the other day. Um, Ramiro, I think I'll put you on the spot right away. I, I think there was one thing that you made uh, very key, I think, when we were discussing the topic of, of testing and how you approach it. And, and I don't recall, if you, I don't know if you recall what, what I'm uh, leaning towards, but I see the word on the, on the screen here. And I was wondering if, if you wanted to maybe mention that. Which word? There's a lot uh, of words on this one. <laughs> well, I, think the, I think the one you were saying most of all was planning. Like you can't, you yeah. don't want to go into this without a plan, right? And so that's part right. of what we can discuss today is what goes into that plan and how do you make that plan happen essentially? Yeah, planning is a uh, is key, and we work with a lot with our customers who basically just start clicking everywhere, and then they're like, "We're sort of lost with this tool." So that's part of like the consulting that Andy has helping us with, plus a few others. So yeah, planning is uh, very very important. Definitely. Um. So. I mean, looking at, uh, you know, the different different organizations that we work for, I mean, the different ways in which these teams are are built, you know, of course, we're seeing more and more agile teams as well. So there's a little bit more of a standard kind of formation to those teams. Um, but we really see it all, right? We see the gamut of um, teams that are just step, stepping into automation for the first time. We're seeing teams that are coming from automation that hasn't been working well or isn't keeping up. And it seems like more and more this is becoming more important, uh, more critical, especially in a, in a CI CD kind of world, right? Excellent. Here, I uh, I was thinking at that last point, focusing too much on writing tests. You know, it's uh, I, I love BDD, I love Gherkin syntax, and like everybody want everybody I speak wants that, but they start with this at the last point, which is focusing too much on writing this big test cases and taking too much time without actually putting these test cases into, into a tool, into your test suite. So yeah, so, uh, these are great points. I, I have to make a shameless plug right here because we, we just got this, by the way, this is actually a, a new Ninja. If you know Telerik, you know that we're all about our ninjas. In fact, I got a couple of ninjas on my shirt right now. Uh, we've had ninjas as our, uh, one of our mascots forever. And we just got one specific, or at least an updated one specifically for testing and test studio. And uh, just wanted to make a, a quick note of that since we have that up here on screen. It's a great job, I think, by the, by the design team. Love the shield. Very cool. <laughs> I love the shield, yeah. I want one. Exactly, yeah. Get, you one. get some swag <laughs> soon, right? Nice, nice. 
Awesome. So understanding the priorities, uh, where testing fits, right? I mean, Joe, you probably talk about that a lot with folks. Uh, you know, testing doesn't usually fit, does it? <laughs> no, no, that's for sure. That's for that's, that's so so true. Yeah. So you know, understanding where you, who owns the testing, um, and, and where it fits into the process, process, but also knowing that it alone isn't going to fix everything. Automating is not going to do everything for you. It's not the silver bullet, right? It's not going to fix everything. You know, you still might have some other things you need to do. You, you may have, of course, manual testing. I think at the end of the day, as much as we want to automate everything, um, you still have some stuff that's going to probably be done manually, right? But the goal is, you know, can we speed up the testing enough to keep up with the release cycles, which are getting faster and faster and faster, right? Absolutely. Um, and Ramiro, I was thinking about this slide actually with, you know, what does it require? Um, and, and this is one that, uh, it doesn't say it here, but I was going to put planning in parentheses next to one, two, and three, essentially. <laughs> you know, the investment is, is huge. Uh, an old friend of mine, Jim Holmes, he's well-known within the testing, having a discussion on what this investment is. And automation, uh, to get to a place where of, of happiness with automation, you're looking at a pretty long journey. And that investment is time. You're looking at, you know, up to two years of actually working with the systems and getting to know. And that, you know, can scare a lot of people, but this is where sort of tooling can help uh, cut that investment down a bit. But it's it's a long time. It's a long commitment to make. But if you can get there, maybe sooner. I don't know, Joe, what do you think? You think two years is, is too much, too little? Like, where where are you at in your experience? Oh my gosh. It, it all depends, like you said, on the culture of the company and making sure that yeah. you have top top down buy-in and bottom up buy-in. It's it's really a almost a balance beam uh, and setting expectations for both developers, how much they're going to be involved, and also from managers, how much uh managers and as, uh, as far as the uh you know CTO, how 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 realistic it is. Because a lot of times they come in, thou shall have 80% automation within a week. So it's it's a balancing act. So it could take two years. I would as I was at a company very dysfunctional. We we were Doing things wrong for six years, no matter how much uh, you know, protest was done. So, I yeah. don't know. Not a good answer, but it, it all depends, I guess. It does. It does. It's just when you start to think of those investments, it's 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 wild, right? You think, right. okay, we got to put. And sometimes, like you said, Joe, it does click. We have a, a large bank institution customer of ours who has picked up the tool, and they came back to us. I think we met with them a couple of weeks ago, and they were like, "Yeah, we are cutting out at least eight to." 12 hours a week of actual work is being cut out by, by implementing a tool or implementing the, these procedures and the tools. So like for us, it's like, wow, that's, you know, a reduction of 20, 30% just out of the gate. Let's see where you're going to be in three or four months from now. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, I think the hardest part is right up front, right? When, and there's, I think there's so many people and so many companies out there that are like, we really want to be automated. We want that, 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 you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, the, the CI CD pipeline that does everything right while I sleep. And it's just, you know, yeah, that's cool. That's all available. In fact, we've got a lot of that tooling in our, uh, in our stack and across, uh, and across the greater progress stack of, of tooling, but, uh, it still takes a lot of work and you have to be ready for that long-term commitment. Number three there, you have to bring some skills to the game and you certainly have to invest in it. But I think that initial phase is what you got to be ready for, right? That's it's basically like a, a journey that starts with a, a mountain climb before you can really get to the plateau level, because you've got a lot of work to do, either to clean up old testing that you uh, that's broken that you got to replace, or to start something new. Maybe even moving from a manual into automation for the first time. So you know, be prepared for that. Uh, be prepared for the for the climb before you get to that plateau, basically. Yeah. Sweet. It is good though. When you get to that plateau, it is, it is really sweet. Yeah, it is. And uh, we, like you mentioned, one of those customers, uh, we hear it a lot, um, uh, where they do make it there and, and they're, and they're super grateful. They're super, super thankful. And I mean, the effect that it has not only for the culture, as Joe pointed out, I mean, culturally, this is a change, right? Uh, it's not just adding tooling. It, it is a cultural mindset. It's a, uh, a new way of of business process 
that you have to adapt to. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Absolutely. Yeah. There's actually people in the chat. Aaron says full framework equals two S stats at for two years. And another one said uh, ROI on automation tests within about nine months. So uh, people wow. like I guess it depends. One has two years, one has nine months. Um, so interesting. Yeah. And this is actually a great slide, Andy. I mean, who owns testing? To me, the entire organization owns testing, right? Uh, I love to tell people we do coaching, mentoring. Uh, you should take all your tests and actually store them with your source. They should be part of that source and moving along with all that source code as it moves through. So, you know, when you look at the slide, you look at, well, manual testing, dev owns testing, most companies, right? Most companies are duplicating the effort. Is it necessary? I don't know. But to me, to me, I think the organization really needs to own testing. It's 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 critical for the developers, the manual QAs, the SDED or whoever may be doing the testing to realize that this is a, a big effort. You know, we don't ship CDs anymore. So if we do make a mistake, we can push updates, I suppose. But I think that testing for me is something that um, should be owned by the entire organization. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a great, a great concept. I mean, it really is. And there's so many different types of testing. Um, but but at the end of the day, it's you know don't want your your customers your users necessarily to be your testers, right? And I mean, I, yeah. I, again, I think there's a lot of people that have the desire to get there, but uh, you know it's it, it, and I, I don't want to make it sound like it's too high of a mountain. Obviously, we do a lot of work with our customers, a lot of coaching. Even you know, there's even customers of ours where we build it for them and hand them the keys, kind of thing. So I mean, those options are out there, and lots of of different tools that can help do the same. One thing I was going to mention on this slide, though, is the the most company section maybe doesn't say well enough um, that I've run into a lot is talking to co most companies. I might have a conversation with the development team and ask about testing, and they tell me all of the testing that they're doing or not doing. And then, uh, you know, that seems like a well complete conversation. And, and then I say, well, do you also have a manual testing team? And I've been surprised so many times, not surprised, I guess, anymore, but that that didn't fit into the conversation we were having around the testing that they're doing. And they're like, oh, yeah, we, we do also have a manual testing team. And it's like, well, that's some of where the duplication really typically comes in and where, you know, the old strategy of developer testing over here and manual testing over here are still just doing two separate things and going maybe not in two separate directions, but at least not necessarily collaborating, you know, and, and, and uh, finding efficiencies between their testing. Yeah, that's a good point. Before you continue, uh, we just have one question from yes, Slido. I just want to sneak it in here so it's a little more interactive. I don't want to interrupt your flow, but uh, before you get to the next slide, someone wants to say, Rob wants to know, please explain more detail around information broker versus quality gatekeepers as you go along. Information broker versus quality gatekeeper. Hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Mary? You got any initial thoughts on that? Uh, I'm thinking about it. It's a great question. Yeah. I'm thinking about this one. Yeah. You know, quality gatekeeper. That's, I like, yeah, I like uh, that term. I like the term. I love the term, but it also has some sort of like negative connotation. Like I can't ship if I can't, you know, if right. the gatekeeper doesn't yeah. open. So it's, it's interesting. Right. But I think without that, a lot of stuff would make it out of, of, out of the dev team into into the into the wild, that isn't maybe correct or maybe right. So that that's an interesting interesting term. It yeah. Sounds like a t shirt. Sounds like a t shirt idea. <laughs> I just picture somebody standing in the way of the pipeline. I picture like, nope. our new ninja. Our new ninja <laughs> standing right in front of the, the gates of release. The gates yeah. of F five. Yeah. On the other side is the end of the rainbow, and you can't get there until you get through. Yeah. It, so. No, that's a good point. I mean, uh, and, and maybe it is becoming more and more important too, because we are going faster. Things are speeding up. Uh, development's getting, I'd like to say, easier so that it allows it to go faster. And, and with that, you know, testing is actually becoming more important. You know, it was only maybe, we've been at this for over a decade now, but only about five or so years ago where the discussion was a little different. It wasn't as, uh, I guess, common to have that testing conversation. Uh, in a, in a development life cycle, right? Yeah, I mean, it was always, I hate to call it an afterthought, but for a lot of companies, it sort of was an afterthought in the sense of there wasn't a first-class citizen within the organization. So it was, you know, yeah, Excel and, Excel and QA. So. Exactly. And that's still to, today probably the case in, in many places. Um, you know, and I like yeah. to think that um, 
there there are plenty of other uh, other options, all sorts of options out there, open source and and, and uh, commercial tools and things like that. But that uh, that both developers and QAs can begin to kind of work together, right? And that's the other thing is that not only are things going faster, we're kind of being forced to work together in different ways. And that kind of back to my point of the the more more agile teams popping up, more people. You know, Agile's not new, but there's uh, a lot of people I think that are that are finally getting it rolled out in in mass in their in their organizations, where previously it was more of a small pods or small experiments or a certain product teams that did it. Whereas now it's becoming more standardized for for organizations to, to organize like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember we've been doing Agile for a long time. Uh, I used to do Agile coaching mentoring years ago too, and it was, you know. The sprint was a, a revolutionary new thing for people, and it's been around for what, almost thirty years now. So, like, it's yeah, it's, it's interesting that you know teams are now moving. Now, the term sprint is just the way that I think most teams that we speak with, at least every team that we speak with, is actually developing. You know, my team develops based on sprints. You know, they do two week sprints, but yeah. So, yes, but we also know by definition that agile includes testing, right? So if if we're uh, there's so many customers I talk to that are that are uh, what I would put under the fragile uh, category, where <laughs> you know you ask them, it's like, well, are you doing testing in your sprint? And they're like, well, we actually we do a testing sprint. And it's like, nope, <laughs> that's not agile, man. You got to have it in each sprint. You can't have a separate, you know, if you're doing it right, if you're doing it by the book. That's what I'm saying. But obviously, sometimes we need to have some spikes, or we we need to have some. Uh, um, you know, some bug sessions and stuff, bug bashing sessions, but, uh, but on the regular, hopefully it's part of the process. Yeah. And that's why I was telling you earlier, it should be part of the source code. It moves along with the source code from, you know, from iteration to iteration. Definitely. Uh, so what do you think? Anything here, grab your attention. Um, you know, the coverage, the duplication, I see some, this guy's got a lot of code back here, developing <laughs> SDET kind of style tests over here. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, when you look at test workflows and not features, right, um, That that's great. And that's where you can really optimize. And this is when you really start to get to a a good level of test coverage. Like Andy says, no silver bullet. You're not going to get 100%. And if you do, please write to us. We'd be interested to take a look at how you get 100%. Um, but if whatever you may get, whatever that acceptable percentage is going to be, um, you know, testing test the workflows is way better than the features, right? The features will adapt and change. The features will contain the defects. But if you're just testing the feature, you might miss that, right? That workflow will catch any potential defect that gets introduced into the ecosystem. So that, to me, always stands out. That's something that we always try to preach is, you know, look at the test flows. Like, again, not, not to shamelessly plug my tool, but we have, like, a workflow. You can actually see it as the steps are happening. We have images. You can compare and contrast those images. So that's really giving you a visual representation of that workflow. So, Yeah, and I think... Uh... That's key. You know, there should there should still be unit testing happening at the at the development level for sure. And I, I think that last bullet point is a good point uh, in that in that efficiency and redundancy. So when we come in, we uh, you know to a, to a, co- a, a client that's looking for help, that's one thing that we're looking at in the planning. Right, going back to that slide previously with the sliders on it. You know, who owns testing? Who do you want to own testing? Who owns it today? And who do you want to own it tomorrow? As far as you know who's the one that goes in and creates and maintains these tests that are uh, basically running continuously, right? Either overnight or on the weekends, or as part of a build or part of a schedule. Um, but yeah. it comes down to you know who's responsible when the test breaks to uh, to maintain that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting too because like when you mention you know automation, that's really the top of the pyramid, right? So you have your unit test at the bottom. And if you're doing it correct, and if you have enough time for unit tests, that's another whole discussion about time unit testing. But if you have that time and you start doing your integration, API testing, et cetera, you know, it's got to give you a better, a better automation platform to work off of. Because again, you can test those workflows and they've already been tested at the minute level and all the way through the integration and into the actual, you know, GUI testing. So. Amen. Yeah. And I think what we see a lot too is I mentioned earlier, people coming from a broken testing uh, kind of system or, or, or framework that, that just has over time maybe gotten too big, too difficult to maintain, too difficult difficult for it to keep up. And, and, and the concept, you know, if you think about like the, 
the alternative a lot of times uh, is, is manual testing. And, and people are like, we got to go fast. How do we go fast? Well, we can either build another project the same size as the application that's going to test the application. And now we're maintaining two projects, basically, or, or we go manual. But both of those tend to not fit into go fast. You know, they don't necessarily fit into a uh, a daily you know deployment kind of life cycle, right? Yeah, I mean the scripts just become flaky by nature. They get more and more complex unless you're doing some a great job of breaking them down, right? And I'm sure you know. I think all of us, if not most of us, on this webinar have QA experience. You know, we start to look at how to make things simpler, and I'm I'm a big proponent of the KISS method. I've always been. I I don't I don't even like writing long emails. Like, <laughs> and you know, my wife tells me she's like, you know, people must think that you just like are like bored. I'm like, no, I just I think a one sentence email is all you need. You don't you know if you need more than that, then hmm, that's a problem. So long story short, it's you know they they will get flaky unless you have a good strategy. Um, but when they become flaky, they need maintenance, and you know, <sighs> maintenance is something that. We all need, but specifically in testing, it's something that is is constantly needed. So, you know, you want to either, this is where the tooling can help. Uh, the tooling can help. And, you know, most tools have element repositories. Um, most tools have the ability to, to try, well, not all tools, most tools can go through the DOM and actually look at where the elements are. So that's going to help with the maintenance. But in the end, you're still going to be doing a lot, a lot of maintenance. The idea is that you don't, that these will add technical debt. But if, you know, again, tooling can help with that. Uh, to kind of reduce that technical debt or get it as low as possible. I think it's actually a great time for the poll. I'm curious to know what the uh, the, the, the people uh, are thinking about. I have the poll live. To find out the poll, all you need to do is click on that QA tab. The poll is right up now. Let us know what testing struggles you're most dealing with yourself. Love to know if it's on point with uh, what Andy and Romero are seeing. So get your questions or get your polling in now. Just click on that. Q&A and select which one you're most struggling with. So are these the three you mostly see when you speak with clients or, um, you know, I know oh, that's why I love speaking with vendors because you speak with all kinds of different companies, all kinds of situations or uh, any of these really pop up as you as like, this is like probably the, the, the number one thing we've seen. Uh, I mean, we see a lot of technical debt. We see a lot of people trying to do testing, whether they have a different tool or whether they're trying a framework, whatever it may be. And then they come to us with this bucket full of things like, we, we're in trouble. Like, we have a lot. How, how can you guys help? How can this product, can this product solve this particular need? And, you know, lots of times when we talk to these customers, it's like, well, it's not just the product. It's also, yeah. you know, the human behind clicking yep. on the product. So, but that's something that we see a lot with our clients. Um you know, and then I guess second to that would be the flakiness. Uh, a lot of times uh, our customers are looking for a tool that like, for example, us, we have this element repository. We can look at image verification. We have OCI. There's a lot of things we have to keep those tests and be able to scale and make them, you know, you know not make them brittle or, or flaky. Andy, I don't know if you got any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if it's a, if it's a well-built framework and tooling on that framework, you know, those, those features are there that, that allow you to, you know, keep up. And I think that's really what it tends to be is, you know, when it, it's great when automation is done well and it can, a test can last for a long time, a robustly built test, a sophisticated test can last for a long time without breaking, you know, and I, I hear it a lot. One of the things I hear a lot from customers is they'll say, well, you know, we had a, we had a new release and we had to rewrite all of our tests. And I'm like, well, what changed? I mean, did you have like a full rebuild or something? And it's like, no, we just, we just moved a couple things around. We added some stuff and everything broke, you know, the tests all broke. And that, that's just, that's tragic, really. <laughs> yeah. When they change the color of the login button from a light blue to a slightly lighter blue, lighter <laughs> blue, it's like, raise the test. Oh. Exactly. And it's, uh, it's just, just, it's too, it's too bad. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that shouldn't break tests. That's the kind of stuff I guess we get to at least uh, hang our hat on is that we've developed some of those features that help to, you know, make the test more robust. I love telling people that I have tests that are really old and they have a lot of mileage on them because that's just not a concept that you get used to in testing. You're more used to, oh, it's broke. We got to rebuild it. Yep. Well, if you're constantly rebuilding the test, 
how can you rely on its results, right? You don't have any history on that test because it's brand new every time you have to rebuild it. Uh, whereas with, with the ones we have in Test Studio, it's like, even if it breaks, I can adjust it, I can update it, and I can still run that test. I can evolve that test rather than throwing it away and having to rebuild it. Um, yeah, but the beauty of that is, is when you finally ship your application, let's say it moves into you know, stable release and, and the dev team kind of moves away or goes into even just like a maintenance mode, all those tests are still there already. So you can go ahead and take all this effort that was put in and just move it along, move it along the chain as the application matures through its life cycle. So. And this is a great segue. The pull results are in. I just wanted to share with you. Uh, Andy was kind of talking a little bit how uh, this is. Uh, Flaky automated test is the number one thing most people are struggling with. And Andy was just saying that a lot of times using the right tool or the right technique uh, can can avoid this. So uh, not not surprised by this. Uh, tech, technical debt is 25%. 40 people. Thank you, everyone, for, for helping uh, participate, making this uh, really interactive. So I know Andy Romero, I'm not surprised by these results. And I think it's in line with what you've been saying all along. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it really comes down to this, yeah. right? Time costs money, right? We're trying to go fast. Spending time is going to slow us down, which is going to keep us from getting our product to the customers and the users, which is going to ultimately, you know, leave us uh, short on maybe where we want to achieve our revenue targets. So you got to get out. You got to get your releases out. You got to get them out fast and clean if you want to compete today. Yeah, it goes back to that. Do you ship by feature? Or do you ship by time? And it's usually the answer is both, right? It's always both. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think we had this one in here. This came from, uh, I think, one of those banking customers you'd mentioned uh, taking, uh, and we've got a little bit of the European uh, 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 common set of the point here. So for, for our European friends, uh, you know, kudos to you, a little shout out. But two and a half hours of testing reduced down to 20 minutes, right? But that's not the whole story, right? The there's work to be done that mountain to climb before you. This is the plateau. This is this is after that mountain has been climbed and you've got the uh, the results where you can sit back and say, hey, we used to do two and a half hours of testing, and this is short. I had another customer that said we had two manual testers that would take eight hours to run three tests, very extensive workflow kinds of tests through very large applications. Eight hours, two people, that's 16 hours to get through those two, uh, those three tests. And that was reduced down uh, to, to 30, 45 minutes, you know, with, with automation and with sophisticated testing. So uh, there's a reality there, you know, back to that previous slide, all of a sudden when that time comes back, uh, you also may find yourself with more money, right? Yeah, and like less. you said earlier, it's it's not a silver bullet, but you know, I'll take that. That means uh maybe a long lunch break, maybe I get home on time for dinner. I mean, it means more productivity, it means a lot of different things, but you know, it's it's again not that silver bullet, but good enough, right? I would say. Yeah. And and really this this is coming from two and a half hours of manual work with people involved to 20 minutes of automated work. So not only are we reducing the time it takes, we're also alleviating the people that are about freeing them up so they can do other things or go faster, right? Help everybody go faster. Or have a long lunch break. Yeah, I like that idea too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I like that idea. Yeah. I'm all for lunch. So removing the human factor, right? There's some, this is part of the cultural change, uh, freeing up that physical time, getting the results sooner, getting everything to speed up. Timely feedback. Feedback is key. Um, one thing I really love about automation is the, the idea, the concept of I go to bed at night and feel feel fine and can sleep well, right? And tests are running. And when I wake up, I, I look at my email, and before I get out of bed, I can see do I need to hit, you know, do I need to get out of bed or can I hit snooze, right? How many of my tests passed? How many of them failed? I can see that you know, from, from these nightly runs or from a, a build run or something like that before I even go to tackle that. So, you know, it's that cultural change where the tester is no longer starting their day with, okay, login, username, password, submit. Okay, that worked. You know, rather than starting at the beginning to begin testing the whole application in a manual kind of format, uh, you're now coming in and you're responding to what's broken. You already have the answer. So, and I always talk about the, the, the QA catch 22, where 
you think about those those uh, examples I mentioned, the eight hours to run three tests uh, for two people, right? That type of thing. If let's say after at the end of the eight hours, it's a pass. That's great, right? But at the same time, that catch that catch twenty two, it, it kind of gives you a little pit in your stomach that I just spent eight hours proving that something works. When you know, if you flip the script and you have that automation in place, you can go into the day focusing on what's already broken. You know, is it a test that's broken? Is it the application? Is it a bug that I just found? Do I need to send this over that feedback loop to the development team? Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot to be said about that. You know, and this is a good segue for the next slide because you can actually literally see what it means for our customers. Um, yeah, this is great. I mean, 80% decrease of time needed for regression testing. 80%. That's a lot of time. Dramatic right. reduction of time needed to complete a test cycle, right? An increase of automated testing from 5 to 30%. Again, not that silver bullet, but 5 to 30% is a lot. Is a lot of time saved. So for our customers, this is what it means to them. So I, I, I've always liked this slide. I've always liked these quotes. Um, we have great relationship with these individuals and, and these companies. And, you know, this is when we took those quotes, it has improved more since then. They continue to push the boundary and we work closely with them to continue to push more and, and get better. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's a lot more long lunches, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of what we were talking about too. You know, the, Manual doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in. You can't put manual testing in a CI/CD pipeline. It's not. It's, it's like, okay, you know, the, the the command line goes out and it says, okay, here, let's just do this deploy. Let's put everything together. Let's start up the agent. Da da da. And then it says, okay, now bring in the manual tester. Start the manual test. It just doesn't fit, right? You have to have. If, if this is your goal, you have to really be thinking automation. I think, right? Mm-hmm. In CICD, I remember years ago watching a CICD pipe at a conference and it, it was just constantly moving. Everybody was wowed, right? And like, it's something that a lot of people want to get to, but this is one of those components, the manual, like context of it, of how do you actually provide a, a get a CICD pipe going with that. So that means that you have to strip out some of the testing, all of the testing that are you for you to have that pipe. And, you know, that's what things can get really interesting. So it's a great slide. Definitely. Um, so on top of that, we were kind of talking about this as well. And, and this has come up a lot lately, um, you know, working with customers, especially in the CI, CD realm, the pipeline, uh, holy grail that they're after, and, and, and the idea of running smoke tests. Um, so I guess what, what would you, if you could give it a definition, Ramiro, what would you, how would you classify a smoke test versus some other type of test? Plug it into the wall, see if it smokes, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's the, the basis of the basis. Will it start up? Will can I log into the app? Will the page, you know, will the application load if it's a spa or you know, all that sort of stuff? Um, they're basic tests, but you know, yeah. Again, to, to add that as a manual process into CI/CD wouldn't work, right? It just doesn't. It doesn't work, unfortunately, and it's tough because you know. Like Joe mentioned earlier, testing is bottom up, top bottom, the whole bit, right? And sometimes CICD is not. Sometimes CICD is actually pushed to some shop. Sometimes it's reverse. Sometimes the development team wants it. So, or what ends up happening is, you know, a small company with a great idea gets bought out by a bigger company that has this massive process. Like, well, now you have to do a CICD, and they're like, well, we have authentication tokens that we have to punch in. It's things like that. So that, you know, creates some difficulty um, for for companies. So, yeah, you know, funny story, yeah, and this, I, I worked for an enterprise and they, they implemented CICD just like uh, Romero said, thou shall do uh, CICD and the deployment wasn't automated. So people had to manually do the deployment before the test could run every night. So it was, it was madness. So that's a great point Romero brought up. Sorry to jump in. Just wanted to get my no. two cents there. Yeah. I mean, we've, you know, <laughs> we've been around for a while. We've seen a lot, of <laughs> it, um, but you know, that's just. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the smoke test. Uh, I mean, I think of those. You know, in the, in the ones I've worked on with customers, it's it's that. Hey, is it up? <laughs> we deployed. Is it is it there? Is everything there? Where it should be? So usually, those are tests that are looking at large layout kind of things. Are the divs all where they are? You know, are the menus showing up? Not as much 
functional workflow, like you were saying earlier, Ramiro, but more of the light and fast, is it up? Is everything there? Is it not smoky? Right. And then, mm-hmm. uh, and, and those are pretty lightweight. Those are typical key in the, in the pipeline process. And then in, in, on top of that, what we typically have is we have uh, test lists that are involved. That's, that's, you know, test suites, essentially the same thing, but our test list, we'd maybe have a smoke test test list that gets run at part of the initial deployment. And then potentially following that, we have a functional regression test list. And, and you're, I mean, really the goal, when I do a lot of training with customers, you're, a lot of times the goal is create a test to test new functionality as that new functionality is being created and then graduate that test to a regression test as that functionality is uh, is level off is 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 completed essentially and finished and so your your hopefully your goal is more and more growing that regression test list so that it's covering all of those things you've previously built you don't have to worry about those unless it pops up and it says hey something's broken over here you know yeah yeah it's again coming back to those workflows right making sure you test those workflows and you start stacking those workflows on top of each other until you get a nice little regression nut. And then from there, you continuously build that out. So it's a, it's a great point. I mean, you can tell Andy's done a lot of training for us, um, but our <laughs> customers, you know, ultimately want to, they want to be able to, you know, hit build or F5 and go home and then come back. Everything's working correctly, but they, that's where, that's where the, you know, comp- compartmentalization, I'm 40 years old. And I can barely say this word uh, <laughs> fits in, right. Where you have these, small little tests that only test the specific features that make something up. And then you kind of just build on top of that, on top of that until you get a very complete test suite. And you can do that, uh, again, with test suite or a test list. You can have one list called an X list, called an X list, et cetera. But again, you don't have to do it all in one chunk. You can actually do that as you move along and, and grow the, that coverage out. So 5% to 30%. I bet you if we hit them up again, it's going to be like 50% now, maybe 40% or whatever. If it's still, if it's 31%, that's still progress for us. Yeah, that's great. There's a couple. There's a couple key things on this slide that um, that I think uh, at progress. Speaking of progress, uh, that our testing tool can do pretty well, or, or maybe some new things that we do uh, that are giving us a, an edge in the game, which is uh, the containerization, right? For in sprint testing, um, the the headless testing as well, the Azure integration, anything you and, and the and the Microsoft hosted or self hosted, right? Anything you want to throw out there, uh, Ramiro, as far as what these features mean? Yeah, I mean, it means that we can play with with a lot of the environments that are there. So, you know, even when it comes to CI/CD, we can plug into Jenkins or anything else. So it's, um, you know, headless testing to me is something that it's very interesting. Um, you know, if you're a manual QA or if you're really looking at a lot of the the images to make sure that the colors are correct or the buttons are right, you know, the, the logo is the right logo. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really help you much at all. But, you know, from a CI CD to have these headless tests, they're gonna run quick. And, you know, that's when you start to get these big regressions, this is one of the I don't want to call it a complaint, but for the sake of this webinar, we'll call it a complaint, is it that it takes too long to run these tests. Maybe they're massive 30, 40 minutes tests, and the you know, the dev team sitting around going, you know, did it build? Is it gone? Did it fail? Like we don't know. So the headless test helps, uh, definitely helps speeding that process up a lot along as you go along these these iterations. Uh, but, you know, Andy, this is probably a good segue to go into Codeless, right? Speaking into Codeless, because, um, yes. yeah, it's, you know, this is an interesting topic. All of us as QAs, um, this is an interesting topic for a lot of people. For, you know, for me, even though I'm the director of product development for a product that does Codeless, it's a very touchy subject for me because if you want to go into the next slide, um, you know, we have the, you know, the, the limited features. They add script that They don't integrate well with third-party libraries. Test hard to maintain. Test the flaky. <sighs> uh, I think Andy can probably say a few words about this because I'm sure he has his tattooed on him somewhere. So. It, may, it may be. Uh, I can't see my whole my whole back. It might be back there, but uh, no, just kidding. Uh, but the yeah, I think codeless is another part of the the goal a lot of times, and uh, I think part of the requirement of going fast is figuring out where your technical debt is and, and getting rid of it. And, and and I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier. A lot of customers come to us saying, 
yeah, we've had testing for years, but it kind of sucks. It's kind of a bunch of technical debt that we want to get rid of. So they're looking for codeless or low code, even if, even if you're the best developer in the world, because they want to spend time developing their application instead of doing test maintenance, right? Nobody really likes doing test maintenance. That I don't know. Maybe we should have a full question. Who likes doing test maintenance? And see who <laughs> says, yeah, pick me. <laughs> yeah. <hired. laughs> yeah. 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 It's, um, you know, and it's the other aspect of it too, is when you have these manual tests or when you have these tests that are really close to the business, meaning the, the, the business analysts, right? That aspect of it. The beauty of this is they may not know how to code. Maybe they're non-technical, right? But they know the requirement well. They know what that customer wants, right? What that customer is doing with this product. They can actually, for example, use a tool like ours to build out what that test is and then have a developer come in on that same test and actually add the specific functionality, the code that they need, more advanced things that are needed. And, you know, they're functioning well correctly. Um, You know, this is a, a very common scenario for us. And for a lot of developers, specifically like for the majority of our customers in the .NET space, right? So if you're a .NET developer, uh, our framework is the best out there uh, for testing. It's it's really robust. Um, you know, it's built with that mentality, C Sharp or VV, depending on most of these days, C Sharp. But you can actually do that. You can take these tests that are basic, that really try the the requirement of the customer. And then add all those complex things regarding permissions or you know whatever you may need for that test. So, so it's yeah. Good. So it yeah, it reduces the maintenance. Is what I was trying to get a very long answer to that. Well, I may be able to help you. I was wondering maybe maybe we could show some test studio so people can get a better feel for what that uh, is you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. What do you think? I think we can. All right. Let's see. I've got some stuff over here I can bring up. Uh, is this showing up okay? Yeah, I can see it. So, uh, yeah, let's give give these folks a, a little look if they haven't seen it before. What uh, what Test Studio is like, and and one of the things I describe to folks when they first see this this is by the way our dark theme. We do have a light theme as well. Uh, but when you step into Test Studio, I think of it as a test workshop, right? It's a, it's a studio, right? But a workshop, like a woodworking shop, where you've got tools around the walls. You know, you've got a lathe, you've got a planer, you've got saws, you've got all sorts of stuff that you use for different types of jobs. Ultimately, at the end of the day, to build something really cool, right? That's the same kind of thing we're doing here. Is we're building some really cool stuff, and we've got all these tools kind of hanging around the walls. This is sort of our our. Uh, production floor in the middle here. And this is actually an example of what I call a parent test. Um, Let me jump back here. Let me open up a couple of these. So this is a parent test. One thing that we have that's really popular is the reuse. So not only are we taking manual and going into automation and giving you a lot of time back, but also we've been really careful as we've built this framework and this tooling to let you reuse as much as possible. So that means reuse tests within other tests. I might be able to just have one login test that runs 90% of my scenarios because they all require A, login, and B, go do something else. I don't need 90%, you know, I don't need 90 different login tests. I just need one. So so using that feature and, and this kind of modular approach, these are actually tests within another test, essentially. Andy, is it possible to change to light mode like we talked earlier? Uh, someone in the chat said oh, sorry, light yeah. mode might be better. Thank you. Yeah, let me do that. Actually, I'm going to reset that real quick. It'll just take me a quick start up here. Um, while I'm doing that too, we could talk about some of the stuff that just happened uh, this week, right, Ramiro? We had a release. Was that this week? It's flying by. Yeah. So it's Tuesday. It was Tuesday, the day after Valentine's Day. That's crazy because I thought Tuesday was Thursday, and then I got to Wednesday, and I thought it was. It's been a hectic one, so I'm I'm yeah. all confused. But yeah, we had some uh, some pretty stuff, pretty good stuff come out, right? Yeah, we had um, you know, we're doing um extensionless recording in Chrome. Um, and you may say, well, why is that cool? Well, uh Chrome or Google in general um is getting rid of all extensions. Uh, some of you folks may or may not know this. And it's about a year's time before it happens, maybe a little bit less than a year before it happens. So that's a big change for a lot of automation tools that exist out there. And it's a big change for us. Uh, A lot of our customers use Chrome, obviously for obvious reasons. Um, And so we wanted to put this feature out well in advance to give customers the ability to test, get used to working with it, uh, make sure that it works flawlessly. 
uh, we, you know, we, we, we have a good relationship with Google. So we knew about this about a year ago and we started actually rewriting the way we do the recording. So, you know, that's, the, that's one of the features that came out. Uh, Visual Studio 2022 support is out as well. There's a lot of changes that, that are happening there, especially with the test end of it. So that's good for our plugin because um, we actually have a plugin that is inside of Visual Studio. So what Andy's doing now, you can actually do inside of the IDE if that's your preferred, you know, uh, way of working. And then a bunch of fixes around um, for the product. It's just a bunch of improvements. We were focusing this year a lot, working with our customers and getting feedback on th- of various improvements. So, for example, we're doing a lot of improvements to our load engine. We're doing a lot of improvements to the way that we that what you see here is what Andy's configuring the settings and translators. Uh, a lot of a lot of this here, and while we're talking about translators, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, Telerik is I call them or shovel company. We build shovels. It's a long. Some of you folks may know this from the gold rush, um, but we build a lot of components for uh, for well for web applications, desktop applications. That's kind of what we're known for. And something that's unique to us is that we actually have these built-in translators. So when Test Studio is executing on a test, it may get over, for example, Kendo Grid. I'm getting a bit of an echo. Better now? Okay. Yeah. And yeah, great. And then when it um, says, hey, this is a Kendo Grid. So it's all JavaScript. So it's all client side. But because we recognize that it's a Kendo Grid, we can actually see things that are technically server side so we can actually implement different scenarios that we may need or we may say okay this particular one grid has lazy loading or doesn't have it turned on or off things of that nature that are that can help with tests all right Andy, let's uh you get to go yeah you seeing what i'm seeing i'm seeing what you're seeing (laughs) so i'm just going to jump into the the middle of this test i just really kind of want to show some of what you're talking about this is uh, this is a function we call just run to here means i just want to run to the middle of a test um Really, really useful to debug or to get into a record mode because a lot of our test steps come from uh, creating those those test steps just by interacting with the application. So this actually just put us in a live recorder. It ran my navigate step. It's uh, got the recorder attached here. And actually, I'm going to pause the recorder real quick just to get that question out of the way and these cookies out of the way, stuff like that. Could automate those too, but um, we'll save that for another session. But I wanted to show... You're talking about a Kendo grid, just pulled this one up. And you know, when you use our highlighter here, this highlighting tool, and just kind of pause on, on a control, you could see it extrapolating the layers. So these are those translators kicking in saying, Oh, we recognize that. It's a Kendo grid data cell. That's inside a row. That's inside a, an HTML table, which lives inside of a Kendo grid. And we've built these, these quick steps. So you know, a lot of the technique here is hit record, do what a user does. It's going to capture all that. And then on top of that, you know, pause to add in verification points. You know, for example, in this test, I think I have one that verifies that the a grid is, is sortable or not, right? So uh, over here in my, this test here, Kendo grid, current grid selection is not available. So the selection is not available is a setting of the grid or sortability or groupability. Those are settings implemented by the developers that they get to choose when they're implementing our grid. Now, instead of our test having to even exercise that, we can actually validate it without even exercising it. We can see, okay, that setting set to groupable or not. So those are some advantages that you get when you run across our own controls, but certainly we work with any web technology as well. Cool. I wanted to show that. Uh, I know there's not a whole lot of time, but maybe we can run some uh, some automation here. Not even sure if my uh, if my test will uh, will pass or fail, but you know, let's just do it. Who cares? Um, so I'm actually going to do this run from here. You can run selected steps. These are just great little features that let you stay in a kind of test debugging mode. Um, and because our tests are made. Codelessly, and I'm going to go into that a little bit. You may have seen it as I was poking around there, but because they're made codelessly, they're they're very easy to get in and, and edit, even for a non-technical user. And something that I think we're really good at, we've been really good at for years, is actually bringing the features that you typically would require code. Things like, hey, I want to encrypt a password, or I want to um, data drive something. Right, those may be things that in a lot of other tooling you're you're doing through code, whereas within Test Studio it can be done codelessly. And I did get a failure. This is great, actually. 
we can see here it was trying to verify that this update link shows up. We produce a ton of data with a failure. And this is really, uh, you know, we could show you passing tests all day, but really I do like to show failures so you know what it is you're looking for, right? We're hoping to find bugs before our customers do. So this this red uh, banner here is is actually success in, in many of our eyes, right? That catch 22, we found one. Now let's figure out, is it a test issue? Is it an application issue? And can we fix it ourselves or do we need help fixing it? Uh, so that's kind of what this data here is for. We've got a page DOM at failure. We've got images at failure, complete test log with iterations here that it was running, looks like. Uh, some some failure finds, uh, failure details here as well. And what's cool about looking at this failure log is you can see how a lot of what Test Studio does, right, under the hood. The find logic strategy that we can use to locate an element is a combination of filters against the DOM, right? And then we actually have a backup search that can locate elements by image if it doesn't find it by, by the find logic. And we're not looking at paths or positions. We're actually looking for the elements wherever the elements may go. So this is a very sophisticated way to look for elements and a backup method that helps make our tests still pass, even, even though something uh, minor may have changed. Andy, this is also work. Uh, BJ wants to know if this also works for mobile app testing, or is this just web? Uh, this does. We do have a, what we call responsive web. So uh, here you can see the different test types that we have. In fact, let me go ahead and just click new so you can see a little bit better. Sorry. Uh, there's web. In fact, we'll zoom it while we're at it. We've got web, WPF, uh, desktop testing, which I think we may have some news on. I'll let Romero talk about. Uh, we've got responsive web, and that's really where you're taking your, your responsive applications, web applications, and recording and executing with different form factors. So that's going to give you the ability to have whatever device simulation you want uh, and, and run your test within that. So that's currently our, our mobile solution there. And then, of course, load testing and manual testing. For stuff that you still need to do manually, uh, this is sometimes an oversight. I like the fact that we do have it. Um, and the fact is, it's not anything too glamorous. You're still doing something manually, but we're including the results of that test alongside of the automation. So you have one holistic testing uh, suite there. So uh, I think load testing is interesting. I know Microsoft uh, Visual Studio got rid of their their performance testing module maybe a, a year or two ago. Is this something that could replace that? I would. I'd like to say so. I think. Nice. I mean, uh, we've got a lot of customers that come to us for load testing. Um, the scenarios speak for themselves, right? These scenarios kind of rear their head and say, "Oh, you need to load test." Hopefully, you think ahead and you think we probably need to load test before we launch, right? Because right. that yep. that application evolution of, "Hey, we've got a new application now. Let's go get users." And then, "Oh, hey, our application's popular. We have users now. How many users can we get?" It's that you know, point where you got to start thinking about load testing. Yeah, and that's a good point. Even if you do launch, uh, one of the things that we have, you probably heard of a little tool called Fiddler. Uh, yeah. We can actually awesome. grab one of those Fiddler traces. So if you have people saying, hey, my application's it's hanging up here or there, uh, you can take that, you can run a Fiddler trace, grab that, and you can import it into our tool to generate a load test to actually get those comparisons, see what's actually happening on, you know, on the machine side or whatever side. Nice. Kyle says we uh, use so Jira. We can can oh. the test results update to Jira issues? Yeah, and in fact, I didn't click the button, but on the failure uh, that we were just looking at, we can actually uh, submit that directly into a bug tracking system. Mine says TFS. This works for Azure, TFS, as well as Jira out of the box. This is your feedback loop. So that, that really cool, rich data that we capture at the point of failure, you can instantly, uh, whenever you need to, send that and, and create a bug into Jira or, or TFS or Azure, for example. And, and I got that, this response back basically as well from, from that system. Nice. We're four minutes away from uh, the hour. So I just want to make sure uh, you wrap up anything you think is critical that everyone should know. And I just want to get to a few really quick questions just so people get some engagement here as well. Sound good? Yeah, I mean, I think this one... Yeah. Yeah, you're good. I think this awesome. one speaks for itself. We can leave it up here. We can take get to the questions. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So I, I think I really, uh, this tool, like you said, I think Romero is, if you're doing C sharp, I, I know when I speak with engineers, especially at my conferences, a lot of times they feel like they don't get enough 
tooling around C Shop. This seems like if someone's using C Shop, this would be like the ultimate uh, automation solution. For them. Am I wrong? Is that is that the the am I pitching this correctly? That's spot on. <laughs> you are pitching it correctly. Yeah, <laughs> that's spot on. Cool. All right, so uh, let's get to some really quick questions here. Uh, so the first one is. So Andre, Andre wants to know. Actually, uh, someone in chat wants to know how about AI automation. You mentioned code lists. Do you have any thoughts around AI automation? And is this uh, oh yeah, machine learning built in right here? So <laughs> great slide. What's this all about here with machine learning? Well, really, this this speaks to kind of what I was talking about with um, you know finding elements by find logic, and this is a this is a little behind the scenes. I, I call this the Corvette engine under the hood. This is in the settings where you can actually dictate the find logic strategy of how Test Studio is going to locate your elements. The best way to find them might be ID. In another application, it might not be. So you could change these priorities. If you're Angular, you might be adding ng data, ng model, maybe aria label attributes to this. So this is the key to how we locate elements, how to find them the best way, the second best way, the third best way. And then backing that up, we have our image detection as well. So if it can't find it anywhere on the screen with the find logic, it's going to say, hey, can we find that button by its image? And if it can, it will click it or interact with it and keep the test going, but give you a warning at the end of it. So, so this is something that we've, we're really proud of. Our team's done a lot of work on, and it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, and on top of that, we also have OCR too. So we can actually do ca character recognition to even add more layers of, of it um, onto yeah. the test. Yeah. And we're continuously OCR. pushing. I mean, we're still, you know, we're continuously adding additional features to get to a, a full AI. But I think that in the testing world, that's still, you know, we're still trying to determine what that's going to look like, who, you know, who's going to be the, the player that's going to go ahead and drive drive you know all the companies towards it so we're we're continuously adding features i mean we're, we're released three times a year three major three minor so six total and along the way we uh you know we're adding additional features like andy mentioned earlier one of the things that we're doing this year is we're actually giving full full desktop uh support so right now we only test wpf but we're expanding to to desktop uh that cover full desktop i should say that's awesome mm -hmm. awesome stuff guys so just a few more quick questions uh first uh one we have is from, should I anticipate that I will buy tools that support testing specific libraries of components? Otherwise, am I writing my own code to test each component? Uh, so buying a tool that's specific to the components, is that what it was, sorry? Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess we have an advantage because we sell components um, and there are other you know, uh, tools out there that might, that might be part of a component shop that are more specialized for those components. We, we like to be kind of component agnostic too. Gotcha. Um, you know, in fact, for, for many years, we didn't really tout our, our support for our own controls that much. And actually we're doing a lot more to focus on it. We've had it, we've always had it, but, um, uh, but we're doing a lot more to let people know that, right. Cause there's an, an added advantage to using our controls, but really it doesn't matter. And with Ramiro, what Ramiro said, uh, with the support of full desktop, we're going to be able to automate everything at that point, right? We're right now it's all web and some desktop, um, but we I can't wait until it's all web and all desktop. That would be great. Yeah, and Microsoft's making a big push back to the desktop, where these applications sort of like desktop applications that are web, well, they're web apps that are wrapped in the desktop application, if you will. So it gives us that full that full test where you ha may have something, I'll give you an example like Spotify. You want to go ahead and test something on Spotify, but if you want to update your credential or credit card, you have to jump to the web. So how do you test a scenario like that? You would need two tools. So with us, it'll just be one tool. Um, to just create that one one test and kind of tie those two together, which is nice. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys for this awesome presentation. Uh, like I said, uh, you were on my podcast and I got some people asking, well, I want to see this in action. So I think this was really helpful. So thank you, Progress, for uh, supporting the Test Guild webinar series. Also, I want folks to know if you like this, if you want to hear more about Telerik and uh, these types of uh, technologies, I just opened up the poll for a quick survey. If you could just fill out four quick questions, we'd really appreciate it. So I guess, Andy and Romero, before we go, any potting words of wisdom you want to leave the Guild? Romero, I'll let you have it. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, you got me on this one. I don't know. <laughs> don't That's don't stuff. be afraid. Don't be afraid to climb that mountain. That's Plateau's right. worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
And every journey starts with the first step. So. <laughs> yeah. The ride is worth the climb. Awesome. Thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it and hope to have you back Joe, on, on the webinar. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you, Joe. Thanks. Joe. Appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Take care. Bye.